Hi, I'm Bob Birch. Welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Great to have you along today as we welcome Patrick Kirby. Patrick is the director of the Northern West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center at, the, at West Virginia University. Um, and I had a great opportunity to meet Patrick uh, at the NACDEP conference, uh, NACDEP CDS conference uh, in Big Sky, Montana a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we'll be talking to him a little bit about what he's doing with Brownfields in West Virginia, and also about a presentation he took part of, part, took part in called "Crowdfunding for Real Estate Development: Shaping Cities with Locally Sourced Capital." Patrick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, tell us a little bit about uh, the Brownfields Assistance Center, and maybe some people might not even be know what Brownfields are. Uh, so, maybe you could start there. Sure, I think that's a good place to start. The brownfields are very broadly defined as any property that would normally be redeveloped, but it's hindered by the real or perceived contamination. So a great example would be that local gas station that your grandfather used. It hasn't been a gas station in 40 years, but when someone in town would go to put something else on top of that corner gas station lot, they might still find tanks there. Um, which would obviously cost uh, money to clean up. You'd want it to be cleaned up from a community standpoint, but it may deter development of that corner. And then they may pick another spot in town, which might be okay, or they may pick somewhere outside of town. And if you're in communities that have uh, large scale industrial uh, legacy sites, steel mills, pottery mill or pottery factories, glass factories, that can be a, a big impact on, suddenly moving out from those strategic locations downtown, farther and farther out, and you're leaving these um, large sites or sometimes smaller sites, even dry cleaners uh, can impact the community, then they used to produce a lot of jobs and now they're just sitting vacant and that doesn't do anything for anybody. Oh, what kinds of issues, I think you named some of them, but are there specific brownfields uh, that you deal with in West Virginia? So West Virginia is known for, for steel um, in the northern panhandle. We actually uh, abandoned um, or formally mined lands uh, by def defined by EPA actually can be brownfields uh, because out west you actually have a lot more. So your old uh, silver mines, gold mines, and they just happen to throw in the coal mines on the east coast as part of that. Uh, you also have, we have a lot of glass factories in West Virginia. Uh, we're also known for pottery, um, as I mentioned, but then just a number of old gas stations uh, based on the way the state's laid out. Um, actually, in some other states, just to throw that out there, if you look at, say, Oklahoma, they have a lot of what we call petroleum brownfields just based on their historical uses. Um, so that's really the gamut of sites that we deal with. So how does the Brownfield Assistance Centers uh, in West Virginia, how do they uh, help support you know, reclamation of these things or what's your role? So a quick story is there was a state senator that was interested in developing a baseball field for the local university, not WVU, but down at Marshall. And the property they were, they picked was great in terms of location, but it was a former rail yard. That's another issue that we, we deal with. And he didn't feel like there were the right resources in the state to address his, he had questions he thought somebody in the state should be able to answer it. And the example that I often use is that when you're doing your taxes, you could call, if you have a question about your taxes and we all do our taxes, then you'd call the IRS. They probably have the answer, but you probably don't want to call them. So the Brownfield Assistance Center provides that intermediary role. You would call us almost like your accountant and say, Hey, we have a problem. We want to follow the law. We want to do this, but we need to know all the resources, everything we can get out of this in order to use brownfields as a positive economic redevelopment uh, uh, approach versus just going, oh my gosh, we should stay away from that site. So it's identifying the brownfields as your assets and then turning those into federal and potentially state funding opportunities. So what have been some of the success stories in your area? So some of my favorites is there was a, a library uh, in the Eastern Panhandle of our state that it's supposed to serve 18,000 people and their current library is 2,000 square feet. They found another site that um, was going to fit a new four acre green library to be built. Uh, unfortunately, it was on it was a landfill, former town landfill. And so we helped them get an EPA Brownfield grant. So the state or the, um, the US EPA has a cycle of funding for these kind of sites. 
There was an old pottery site that's now actually been turned back into an industrial reuse again, but the neighbors love it because it brings additional jobs to the area and it's light industrial and it had sat vacant for 30 years uh, and was just a mess. So those are a couple of my, um, some of the fun projects, just even getting some tanks pulled from lo localities that have gas stations that then turn into maybe restaurants or something else. Um, they're a lot of fun. Um, tell me about the West Virginia Brownfields Conference and how that got started. I mean, it's interesting to me that there's enough action going on to support like a conference. Right, in your state. right. No, that's interesting you say that because I'll, I'll put in a quick plug, I guess, not just for the, the state conference, but the national conference in terms of the that EPA holds. It'll be December 5th through the 7th this year in Pittsburgh. Uh, but the key there is it's a, it's a sector. I mean, so you have folks, uh, businesses that want to do the assessment work to identify what the problems are. They want to do the cleanup work, um, sort of different companies that want to do the cleanup work. And then you also have developers that are interested in these sites that have been uh, through the 90s and all the way through the 2000s. And then you also have your construction firms that are associated with them, new technologies related to that, and a lot of community development. And that's sort of where that extension piece uh, extension piece fits in. I mean, there's environmental justice issues as you look at where different new developments are, are cited and making sure that we're cleaning up the old sites before we just pick new sites. Um, so, so there's that piece. But the way that we were created, part of the legislative mandate is that state senator said, hey, we need someone to answer these questions. So we'll create a center both at Marshall and at WVU, and you'll serve as almost extension agents to go out and help these communities find those resources and solve these problems. So we can work with both the public sector, municipalities, counties, but we also work with the private sector because private developers will call and ask for help. And while we're not giving those private developers any public money, we are helping them navigate what is a challenging process, both with um, the State Department of Environmental Protection and within the State Development Office. So that led us to, I'm, I'm sorry, you asked me an easy question. The state, the state conference was part of that legislation. We we're supposed to bring people together. So our first conference had 125 people, mainly driven by the engineers that had to be licensed to do the cleanup work as part of the state process. Our last conference had 310 attendees, and that was mainly, there was only 40 of those 310 that were licensed remediation specialists for training. The, the broader group are community um, developers, local leaders that are interested to not only access the federal money, but to start the process to have those community conversations that lead to the priorities because no one wants to invest just in a brownfield. I mean, you, it's, it, when you say, hey, can I have money to tear down a building? That doesn't seem like a good investment. But if you say, hey, will you invest in a new library? Will you invest in a new, even daycare or a new industrial site? And then you get everybody coming together and say, I'm interested. I want to be part of that new success. And then you roll in the costs related to brownfields into the new success. I had two questions on my mind. Sorry for the, for the dramatic pause. But um, one was, oh, your assistant center, uh, is this, as, uh, I think it's the first I've heard of a state creating this, has it ha do you know if it's happened in other states or? So we've looked across the country. There's Kansas State has a program that does um, a technical assistance for brownfields and NJIT in New Jersey, both great service providers that folks could access. But in terms of a state and providing work within the state the way that we do, uh, we're the only one that we found. Uh, we are not EPA funded, although we have done some research and, and gotten a couple EPA grants and we are only partially state funded. I've worked with a lot of private foundations to do the programmatic growth of the centers. And so it's, a, it's different in that way. Um, it's tough to be within that academic world because the question is what research are you doing or presenting? Uh, what grants are you bringing in? And actually when the centers got created, the first grant that we received it doesn't come to us. It goes straight to the community. That's what we're working with. We're, and so we're an intermediate intermediary to help them get that grant and so when I come into the office and say you'll never guess we got you know five hundred thousand dollars in grants everybody gets excited and they say when is it showing up <laughs> right when <laughs> does it come into our accounts right right so it's actually going to this town and so um, everyone's still all smiles but it's just a little different mm -hmm. 
it, you know, you bring up funding. Um, uh, I don't want to get too political here, but we have heard about, you know, proposed uh, cuts uh, specifically at EPA. Um, what do you see as sort of the future of some of the brownfield funding from the federal government? Um, is that in jeopardy or is that something that you think is pretty safe? That's actually a great question. So on the federal side, um, brownfields have not, the funding hasn't actually been reauthorized since um, 2006 or so, but there's been a push to get it reauthorized. So you're right. It would be normally, I was worried under the zombie funding piece, but it's actually bipartisan. It's been introduced by, um, Republican Senator Inhofe on the, on the Senate side, there's been some House bills and really it just gets thrown in with a lot of other issues and that's why it doesn't go forward. But there's generally bipartisan support because it's money that goes directly to communities to do redevelopment work. So for every dollar that goes into Brownfield redevelopment, there's $18, or I'm sorry, a dollar of the pro federal money. There's $18 of private and other money that goes in to leverage against that. That's based on some recent studies, University of Delaware and other folks that have looked into that. So, so I don't think we're in too much jeopardy. And then when the, the bill that just passed, um, the ex, not the extension, I apologize, but the, um, the bill that took us through September. Mm -hmm. it the was budget actually, bill. Yeah, yeah. It was fully funded. So, oh, great. So, Nice. On the state level, I mean, we definitely fight the challenges. We were in major uh, special sessions and potentially government shutdown, but at the end of the day, uh, the center was funded at the level it's been funded the last 10 years. And, and that's helpful because it provides stability, not just um, for us as staff, but in terms of the communities that have projects to call us, we don't have to change um, the model that's been working. Yeah, I was thinking it's, uh, you mentioned the bipartisan nature, and I think, I mean, it is an interesting kind of dynamic because of the role that this reclamation can play in economic development, community development in rural communities. Um, I assume that's that's got to be an asset with maybe some of the uh, people in politics who might look at this as quote unquote environmental work. Right, well, and so, Leaving my personal politics aside, because I, 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 I would like to see all the sites cleaned up for the sake of cleaning them up. But that's not the reality that we live in. And part of that just comes back to look at your house. There's probably a, a 10 projects you want to complete, but you have to prioritize those. And that's what happens with these environmental projects. And so some of the um, entities that you would want to have cleaned up the sites are just bankrupt. And you can't go back and get them to clean up a site. But what you can do is you can push that community to take um, sort of their own direction and say, what do you want? Take control of your future and then go and get these resources to clean up the site. And cleaning it up is important for the health reasons. But then you add that economic development component and that's what gets everybody's attention. And that's what really drives the bipartisan nature of it. Because then you have a situation where you have somebody working the same place their grandfather worked or even their father worked, um, doing something completely different. And that's great. Uh, in the meantime, it's safe for their kids to come visit them. It's, you know, they can, depending on what the site is and what the level of cleanup is, you can have anything from houses to um, factories on. Awesome. I, I think that's a good transition to this, to the presentation at NACDEP, you know, the crowdfunding for real estate development. I hope it's a good transition. I guess I, I'll leave that to you. Um, shaping cities with locally sourced capital. Um, so I think people are relatively familiar with Kickstarter, GoFundMe kind of crowdfunding. Uh, how does this kind of crowdfunding for real estate development work? So um, it is a great transition. I, I guess when we were dealing with brownfields, I had to explain it to everybody. And so I finally went to a city council meeting and I just started calling them bad buildings. So it's a brownfield or abandoned dilapidated building. I only wanted to deal with buildings that were not occupied. And so not every abandoned dilapidated building is a brownfield, but every, uh, but almost every brownfield is an abandoned or dilapidated building. And you and I could walk and anybody could walk and we could probably nine out of 10 times address, identify all the same, bad buildings in a town. When you get into downtown, you start walking around, people are interested in investing in their community or interested in fixing those buildings up. But I'm not an investor. I mean, I'm just trying to attract these developers. 
So there was recent legislation that allowed for the success of uh, um, crowdfunding into the market of um, into the market like, like Kickstarter. There are different portals called Small Change and some others that actually take projects. And they're already got a project basis. So it's not just, hey, let's go take that building and we're all going to raise 100 bucks a piece and we're going to buy it for 100000 and the community is going to own it. It doesn't quite work like that. You're actually investing um, in a project and you're filling that gap that's needed, but it's buying that local piece of that project. So when you, um, if you invest in a building project that has an ice cream store at the bottom and residence is up top, you are more likely to patronize that, um, that ice cream store and to make sure the street is clean because you want your investment to work. And what you're doing is you're teaming with, and there, each project is different, but you're becoming that gap for that investor that was already going to build the project. And they went to the bank and they've got X amount of money into it. And they have a, a small gap and they need more money. And they could go to the sort of mezzanine loan financing market and you could get maybe additional financing but this way they know that the community wants what they're building and then as an investor each of the the way it pays out is different like in kickstarter they're going to send you if they're making a movie they're going to send you a movie poster well you don't get a movie poster you don't get free muffins at the local at the bakery at the bottom you don't even get a free ice cream cone if you've invested in that project but what you do get is a part of the project that may pay dividends depending on how the project is set up or get some return on your investment in some other way, but it's a financial return on investment. And that's just, it's exciting because it lets you buy in. And so what um, a presentation was on and this idea of crowdfunding for real estate development is the SEC Securities and Exchange Commission provided guidance, West Virginia passed legislation, other states have passed legislation that allows for unaccredited investors to get involved. So it's, folks that aren't investing large amounts of money because there are already investments in real estate, but this is a different way to do it. And it keeps it um, safe. I mean, it regulates the market a little bit. So for whatever your favorite project is in your town, you could say, Hey, if we all got together, if we're going to look at this project, someone would have to take the lead to start it, put it in this portal, and then you would be able to go online and invest your own money into it. So you mentioned some of the regulation. Are there still regulatory hurdles in doing this? In some states, there are, and there are some challenges. I would say that we try to get the, uh, the portal master, I'll call them, uh, to talk to us about some example projects. And this is still fairly new, so people get worried about what does it look like. And so I couldn't just tell you about this great project we're doing as one of um, – real estate investment for crowdfunding uh, and then try to get anybody that's listening to invest in that. It has to be sort of quiet until you're on the portal. You're not allowed to try to raise money outside of that. So you can't tell everybody about it. And so it's also an education process that you have to explain to everybody. What are the legalities of this? The same way you would try to explain to people how you invest in stock. So it was a good option. So is that one of the risks here is just, you know, like, like in a Kickstarter campaign, you know, uh, we've heard the horror story ones, you know, it's like you collect all this money, but you didn't do what you said you were going to do or those kinds of things. Uh, is that, is that one of the risks, especially when you're talking about people considering this as an investment, not sort of maybe a contribution like they might consider it in, in different crowdfunding? No, that's exactly the case. Uh, although there are probably because of the way that it's set up more safeguards than there would be. So when you're sending money to Kickstarter and to go, go, you know, you're really making, you really don't know that person. Probably you just like the idea of what they want to do and you want to support them. It is more like a contribution where this investment, um, in order to get into that initial portal to actually even be advertising the project, you have a lot more hoops to jump through. So there's some more certainty there, but like any investment, it may not work. The, the concept though is there's, it's more likely to work because you've invested it and it's local. So you're not just sending your money somewhere else or it's not some get rich quick scheme. It's, Hey, I, you, cause you'll be able to see that building downtown every day. I mean, you can find out what's going on. You know, if 
um, its residential project, you could see it start going downhill and you could probably catch it before it really went downhill, if that makes sense. So you mentioned sort of uh, some of the uh, impacts in terms of, uh, you know, people frequenting a business maybe because they've invested in it. Um, is that, is that where the real sort of impact comes in? Is it, is it in the fill in funding? Um, is that the huge impact that the development doesn't happen without this fill in funding? Or is it the fact that we, because we chose this fill in funding, uh, it gives the community more of a feeling of ownership over the project. I, I think it's actually both. Like, I think you nailed it. It's the idea that the community, there's a need for the community to buy in, but it also shows that developer that we're interested in this. This is an exciting project that the community is behind. So that helps on all levels. It helps even on the political front to say, hey, we really want this to happen and we've invested our money as a collective community. So it's not one person that, and you can't, they're different safeguards. So you can't just put all of your life savings into one project, um, which is helpful. <laughs> but then um, you look at that end and then you say, but the community is also going to be looking out for the project. So if you're the developer, a lot of developers, a lot of communities are looking for an out of state developer. They think that if the local guys could have done it, they already would have. So if the white knight could come in and invest and save the town, well, that's great. But if they're out of state, they're not looking at it every day. This is the closest thing you're going to get in, um, instead of um, an entrepreneur being able to finance it all themselves. I mean, a, a local entrepreneur, this allows for some outside investment and you're capping on top of that. And then you're looking at it every day. And then you can take, if you get excited by that and you say, wow, well, this is making the town like I want it to be for my grandkids. Then I'm going to take my return on investment, which was already risky because I've never done anything like this. And I'm going to invest in the next uh, community real estate project in the same town. Do you see the future of this sort of expanding, like more states opening things up? Um, how do you see this going forward? I think we're on the front end. I think it will provide jobs for lawyers <laughs> um, and with the recent market. No, but in all seriousness, I mean, I think that um, what we're seeing out of, and I don't like to get sort of the generational speak, but when you have those conversations of how are the millennials are going to invest their 501, um, their 501 K they want to invest in things that have an impact. When I interview folks, both for the center and in other uh, organizations I'm involved in, that's the number one thing I hear when I interview, well, why are you interested in this job? I want to have an impact. And so I think that it is going to grow. Um, I think that anything related to money and investing, there's always a fear of the scams um, and what could happen. But I think that uh, there are a number of um, agencies and a number of um, other stakeholders that are looking at this to make sure that doesn't happen. And that you'd also see it locally so quickly. I mean, everybody will know, just like you said, if the money goes in and the building doesn't get built, you know where to go. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's going to grow. And I think it'll grow pretty rapidly. And I'm hoping that it grows. I think rural is going to be what I consider rural. I mean, in West Virginia, we have towns of 600, 1200, you know, 3000 is actually a, a pretty cool small town. Um, so I, I think growing in those areas between that three to 5,000 town and the 15,000, maybe 25,000, but in that gap, I think you could see a lot of growth. If people want to learn more about this, are there places that they could they could reach out to? Yes. I mean, um, you could reach out. Uh, there's information on our website at wvbrownfields.org. There's also um, the Small Change portal, uh, which I believe is just uh, smallchange.com. That could be incorrect. I apologize. I just didn't have to memorize. We'll, uh, we'll, fi we'll find that and, and get it in the show notes. Okay, great. And so there are those two places. Um, there's actually just a lot of SEC guidance. If you want to just I hate to say, just Google it, but there's a lot of different information out there, but um, we definitely have some stuff up on our website. And if they contact me, we have actually the booklets that I was giving out um, at the conference already that has all the information that has all the definitions and they're small enough, like a CD packet that we could ship it anywhere. Awesome. Uh, thanks for your time, Patrick. This has been really informative and I uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us on the podcast. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Patrick Kirby is the director of the Northern West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center at 
West Virginia University. And you've been listening to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Uh, be sure and check out the show notes. They'll be at bobbirch.com. You can find us anytime on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. And reach out to us on Twitter. It's at WDNEXT. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.